Hello and welcome to NARC Live on Wednesday the 28th of April 2021 coming to you from Norfolk on the east coast of England with Tammy M0TC Hello and me David G7RP Great to see you On tonight's show we're looking forward to getting to know Donard de Kogan M0KRK Fantastic results from the International Marconi Day special event last weekend and we find out who worked from a shack like this. I only had two entries, so this is your chance. If you know you want to enter late, late, uh, you can do that on Facebook or on BATC now. Just put your name and call sign and tell us whose shack you think that is. And my only clue on the newsletter, by the way, this their new one is better because this was a shack that they used to work from about six years ago. And I said that their new one is surely better. No contest, really. That's the only clue. You've got about five minutes or so to let us know. All right. Hello. Great to see you. Firstly, then, this we've had a wonderful result on the International Marconi Day, despite all the challenges. Steve G0KYA has written this piece about the weekend's activities or Saturday's activities. NARC's Radio Hams managed to contact 923 other radio amateurs in 71 countries on Saturday's International Marconi Day. Our Norfolk Amateur Radio Club ran the all-day event to commemorate Caster's original Marconi wireless station, which was established in 1900 and was in a house in the high street known as Pretoria Villa. And its original purpose was to communicate with ships in the North Sea and the Cross Sands Lightship. Each year, Norfolk Amateur Radio Club normally operates from Caster Lifeboat Station. But due to the COVID restrictions, the amateurs operated from their own home stations this year. Using the call GB0CMS and a mixture of Morse code, speech and digital modes like FT8, the operation ran from midnight to midnight and contacts were made with other radio amateurs across the UK, Europe, Asia, South America and North America. And notable contacts were made with New Zealand, the Philippines, Ecuador, Dominican Republic, Panama, the Falkland Islands and Indonesia. And I say well done to all those guys there who operated from their homes, remember? Very, very rare that you can do that. Well, in fact, it's impossible normally to do it as a special event because it's got to be open to the public, but Ofcom allowed it. And uh, well done to all of you guys for that as amazing contact. So we, uh, granted, we did have a little bit longer to do it, uh, 12 hours instead of probably the normal six or seven that we'd have operated from Caster. But anyway, well done. I don't Certainly think it was 12 us. hours, actually. It was more than that, wasn't it? Was it? I think so. I when thought we it looked was at 12 the hours. Last week. I think it started at midnight. And went okay, to yeah, it may be, may have been. I'm not going to argue. Late in the evening, I think, at least. It doesn't say here, I don't think. Anyway, well done to all of you um, for keeping that station call sign very much alive and, uh, and keeping the club on the map. That's really good. Now, we've got some other fantastic news now because our very own Jim Bacon, G3YLA, won a very special award at last Saturday's RSGB AGM. Uh, it was a award, new award called the Les Barclay Memorial and it was awarded to, it's going to be awarded to those who've made excellent contributions to, e, to propagation research and understanding. And this was specifically awarded for the first time this year to Jim for his work on sporadic E and the development of the E's probability index as well as propquest.co.uk. So warm congratulations Jim as well, that's fantastic. And we did put it on our club website as well. And I know lots and lots of people say congratulations. If you do want to watch the, the award given to him and, and, and by the president, uh, at least virtually, of course, the uh, whole of the RSGB AGM, including the awards and a webinar on EMF that I mentioned last week, um, is you can have a look at that by going to rsgb.org forward slash AGM. We, uh, it was all televised, as it were, if that's the word to use, streamed or whatever from here. So we did the whole AGM from here. Live from Norfolk. Live from Norfolk, <laughs> yes, to the rest of the world. Over, I don't know if you noticed, but over 2,000 people have now watched that AGM, oh. so it's great. So if you'd like to have a look at it, you can, you can just tip in and out of it as well. It's about a three and a half hour video altogether. We were on for three and a half hours live uh, broadcasting, and the AGM's part of it was about two hours of that, and about an hour, an hour and a half of... Uh, webinar with questions and things on that EMF that's coming up on the 18th of May. Does that mean you've truly gone global now then? I don't know about global. <laughs> well we've got out of Norfolk. Yeah. 
Yes, I, I, actually, as you know, I, I drove out of Norfolk today. I went to Cambridgeshire, and uh, that's only my third time out of the county in over a year. Amazing, because the miles we used to do. Yeah. <laughs> Scotland, all, all over the country for our work, and um, that's, the, that's the third, only the third time I've left uh, the county. Anyway. So now, last week, you'll know that we had Ham Pie Radio featured uh, with uh, Michael ZL3AX's project to make a radio. Quite a big project, but uh, explained wonderfully by him. And one of the things he mentioned in the run-up to how he developed it was the Amiga radio that he made many years ago. And Paul G3SEM has sent us these pictures because he made that very same radio. And I did dug up a little bit of information on it. Um, and it was originally published in Ham Radio Today. Now, that looks really nice. I mean, that, that could actually be a commercial piece of equipment. You know, back in the day when that was the style, as it were, look at that. And now look at the inside. So if you've ever made anything or you've ever opened anything, really, to suit, you're going to, I'm sure, admire the construction of this wonderful radio that Paul made. I think it was in the 1980s the project came out in Ham Radio Today. Look at that, the work in that. Some lacing there on the right, I think. Just having a look at these, probably some tuning coils there, I should think, in the top, maybe an auto tuner, something like that. You imagine that 1980s technology, mm. doing that yourself. And knowing Paul's ability, I should think he did all of the metal bashing and everything, all the chassis bending and everything, because he made that wonderful... Uh, That's the filter in the top. Yeah, oh, there's the filter, yes. He made that wonderful tuner for our contesting team. Anyway, thank you very much for sending us those, Paul. And that's not the end of the subject on Ham Pie Radio as well, because we have heard more from Michael this week. Um, and he says that he's had some really good feedback from you guys um, following his talk about that radio last week. He's taken it all on board as well, the feedback. And so he's, he's actually made a few changes. One of the big changes you might have, meant, might have uh, remember is that a couple of people said, has it got a filter, a CW crystal filter? Of course, he didn't know what he was reckoning with when he, did, when he didn't do anything with CW for this club. Anyway, he's actually added it, and I'll read you exactly what he said. He said, a CW crystal filter has now been added, the miniature relay selected. So now two filters can be fitted, SSB and SCW, on the radio board, or any one can be on the board and the other on a Wii sub board using a connector. The PCB is all updated and ready for manufacture. So I think the thing is he was just about to press the go on ordering the circuit boards um, and he's, but he's managed to add that change and add another relay for another filter. He's also added provision for a separate receive trans, uh, antenna, sorry, a separate receive antenna and more than one person commented that this is a big project and might be rather daunting to build and it would be better to maybe as making it in smaller modules. He says I get this, yes it's a big project and one to be enjoyed over time he feels. So it could all be put together and tested in about 50 hours or so in total. But why rush and have just another rig in the shack? Unless this is, of course, your only rig. So he says what he's done to, is to address this by putting rendering each drawing of each of the four boards and highlighting the various sections of the design, like modules or modular. And as one builds the project, it can be done leaving out many sections and these added later at will. All the boards can be used as part of other projects, for example, a superhead receiver, transmit exciter, bandpass filters, and preamp and attenuator, a PA, and everything else, with an oscillator on the board keyboard. Here, there are many configurations, and all the hard work is done. So if you have a look at his website, and there's the details on your screen now, also at the bottom you'll see an email address if you want to contact him. Now, I know that normally we wouldn't want to be seen as sort of commercially pushing anything but this is a basically an amateur enthusiast who's not going to make loads of money from selling those boards especially if you consider all the work that he's put into it um, and what he's asking for is if anybody is seriously interested in wanting to buy a set of boards I think it was going to be 95 pounds or you could be able to buy individual boards as well by the way now um, from from the UK he's got someone in the UK will be doing it can they contact him uh, we can contact via us if you wish just so he has an idea of how many to make is his first build of circuit boards. Um, and also, of course, if we, the club, knows about you guys who are going to make this, then of course we can put you all in touch. And I'm sure that will help the sort of sense of community in building something like this and feedback and knowing the way he's been so far about taking feedback on board and everything. I think this is just a project which he's going to be really proud to have made by lots of people. So 
If you're interested in making it, then if you can contact him and or us as well and tell him what you, what you think about buying, um, then um, he'll make the right number and we'll get the right number shipped to the UK and you won't have to worry about things being imported and things like that. All right, so keep us informed. It'd be really interesting. Lovely to think that some people in Norfolk might be one of the first to build that project. Now a note from uh, Malcolm G3PDH to say that, uh, just to remind NARC contesters that tomorrow night, Thursday the 29th of April, is a data session in the club championships. So ensure you check out your data systems well before the contest. I think it's one of those things, if you've moved your computer or unplugged it or anything like that, that they can be setting up again. So uh, in, in May, he's also said that the first contact se contest session sorry, is the 10th of May with SSB. And uh, finally, on the news section here, I've got to share this with you. Nev M0NFY sent us this picture earlier on, and he said he thought that Roger would particularly enjoy this. I can't understand it. Oh, yeah, it's caps lock, look. It's funny, because I think, actually, I found an <laughs> error on it. Oh, really? Yeah, and I really oh, don't know more. Oh, come on. Now, you didn't tell me this in rehearsal. No, I didn't. Well, <laughs> if you look on the... Um, if you look on the far right, okay. the small... you, you realise you are letting yourself in for well, some maybe. big trouble. But it, the small enter key, because I was Where's trying that? to sort of look at it on okay. the far right, mm -hmm. the, the first, third and fourth digits are the same, which a dot is an E, isn't it? So it's E something E E R. Shouldn't that be so E N T E R? E and I think in there. if in I there. look at the QWERTY across the top, I think T is a dash. Oh, you see, so that's how you worked it out. It is. Could this be a new earth-breaking way of learning Morse? Because if you know where the keys are on a keyboard, if you do as much typing as we have to do, That's and true. many of you at home as well, this could be the breakthrough that Roger's been waiting for and Jim. It could. It wow. Could. <laughs> I can't believe you spotted an error <laughs> on that keypad. Well, I think it looks so. like there, because it looks like three dots on that key. So there you go. That's my, uh, my input for the day. <laughs> I, I think that's amazing. Okay, maybe we should go straight to Little People now because it's all on the same theme. You, all right then. So oh, here, really? Okay, here, here we go. Here's the Little People for this week. Here. Oh! So uh, I thought that would nicely follow the keyboard and also it's supposed to be like a lecture theatre and I thought our guest would, um, would have perhaps oh, yes. spent a, a, a time or two in a lecture hall. So, I bet he um, has. That's and they the, all, the audience. The, do you know, the weird thing is they all look like they're socially distanced <laughs> Yeah, they well, do, don't, don't they? they? <laughs> <laughs> they're a key apart from each other. Well, look at that. Thank you, Tammy. As yeah. always, if you've enjoyed this, uh, miniature-calendar.com, and you can see this and lots of others as well. That's lovely, isn't it? Comments on that Morse keyboard. Can't wait for that. Yeah, actually, they're telling me I'm right, so which is <gasps> always good. I think you're right, Tammy. Paul Brooks says that as well. Um, <laughs> John Atwood says group on Spy Radio. But, um, we, ought to, we always have time to look at these things, but right. we've got a little bit more time tonight. And uh, Roger says, G3LJ says, reading written Morse is extremely difficult. Well, not if you know how to use a keyboard, though, maybe. <laughs> anyway, Roger, I hope you're a rogger, as you've put down tonight, <laughs> your name on there. I hope you enjoy that. Yeah, that's right. Everybody said that. Okay, someone else has... Okay, well, we're on to the shack now, aren't we? Anyway, yeah, so let's a have a look. Guesses. At who? Hang on, I'm not ready for the show. Oh, sorry yet. about no, that. There we go. Oh no, I must just tell everybody. Actually, seriously, we must tell everybody because sometimes people have joined us for the first time. They won't, may not realise how to get in touch with us. And that was that previous slide that you had all done that we did do in rehearsal, <laughs> which is this: radio at dcpmicro.com. That simple email address gets you to us. And if you let us know something by Wednesday at three o'clock is the absolute latest, but earlier if you can. And then it'll get on to the show, as Nev did this afternoon, about 2.30, he sent that picture of the keyboard, so. Okay, now, yes, so, who worked? Who worked? From a shack like this. From a shack like this. I'm just hesitating a moment, because I think we might have just lost the Facebook feed. Just bear really? with me okay. a minute. Just double check. Yeah, it's still going. I think we may be back. Okay, well, sorry for those of you watching, maybe on BETC. We uh, do have a, a separate tiny screen here that looks at coming back, what's coming back, even though it's delayed by about 30 seconds or so, and it just looks like we might have lost the feed to Facebook, and obviously we don't want to continue 
with that if not there's about 37 people on there at the moment yep no i think we just still here a... on facebook someone's just said yep. so I peter think... bishop has said that so we, we think had a little bit of a drop there but we're back now i think okay sorry about that we have to keep an eye on these things though you know we don't want to lose anything now after all the extra work we've put into trying to make this thing foolproof or at least more <laughs> foolproof although we're still relying of course on the internet so lost sound for a few seconds but okay now okay. david says all right thank Good. you very much guys Back to that shack. Back to the shack. So this is someone whose shack it was six years ago who worked from a shack like this. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, any we, ideas? And we have had a couple of guesses. We've had now. a couple of guesses. Yep. So. The trouble is, once they put it on here, it kind of gives others ideas. But anyway, it's okay. Well, it might not be right. No, that's true. <laughs> but I mean, it's just mean that they're sharing their answers, so that's okay. So firstly, Malcolm G3PDH says, my guess is Andy M0 NKR's shack. Uh, John 2 e 0 twq uh, my guess is Laura, Andy's partner, ah, M0 okay. NKR. Or does he mean Andy? Or perhaps he just means sort of both of them. Yeah. Um, Anybody else was guess there the shack? One? I can't remember if there was another one or not. I Thanks for those of you who come back on. My mobs have come back on was. and said that everything is right. Paul Brooks thinks that it's Donard's shack. Oh. Now, that would be a clever move, that wouldn't would, it? One wouldn't week. It? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see. Maybe. <laughs> Have you got Maybe. some more guesses? Uh, I haven't, oh, yeah, we've got some guesses that came in on the email in the normal way. Sunny M0SYW says M0NKR's shack, if my memory serves me correctly, was this his temporary shack while waiting for his new shack to be built? And you've got another guess there? Um, yep, Mark G zero L G J. Very certain the shack is Andy M zero N K R. So I can exclusively reveal <laughs> that it is. It Andy is Andy. Oh M0 well, okay, NKR from about six shack. years ago. Anyway, yep. we thought that similar sort of radio, I think, to what he had. Yep. Anyway. Right, brilliant. Thank you. You ready for this week? Yeah, we, 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 I've just seen a comment on there, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So let's have a look now at the new shack for this week. Who works from a shack like this? Any clues? Just, just think know. for a moment. There's some music on Is the, there? Uh, on oh, the yeah, piano. Some, can there. I hear something actually? I don't know. Not sure. I think you need to wash your ears out. It's a lot of busy shack. Is there a Morse key there though? Hmm, don't know. Not sure. Oh Don't well, know. if you know who works from a shack like this, the only other clue I can give you, apart from possibly some music in the background there, is the only one that we haven't done yet. And that's all I'm going to say. It's strange, <laughs> strange, isn't it? Out of context. It but does. Anyway. It does. All right. So if you know whose shack that is, drop us a line by next Wednesday at three o'clock, please, to that usual address, radio at dcpmicro.com. We'll lose that picture, but we will put it, of course, on the website and on the newsletter as well. And this is the address to send your guesses to. Now, I must, I must come back to that key, clever keyboard that was done, Nev. I didn't realize that Nev actually created that picture. And Nev M0 NFY has put on BATC for us. Grrr, it's put, that means G-R-R-R. -R -R. It took me hours to Photoshop that keyboard. I didn't manage to do all the keys as I wanted to get it off to you. Just trying to raise a smile. Oh, oh you have. Sorry, oh, Nev, Nev. I'm so sorry. <laughs> You didn't realise that I've got a pedantic wife that knows Morse well, really well. Do you know apparently. what? It was actually I was actually seeing if I could read one of the things, and I just happened really? to pick that that key because I knew how to spell enter. <laughs> <laughs> it's about the only word. Anyway, all right. No, no. Um, thank you ever so much for doing that. I didn't know you'd create it. I thought you'd maybe no. just found the picture somewhere. So that's <laughs> it. It makes it even more special that you did that. So thank you for that. I think you might might maybe you'll get some orders for it. Andy has just commented saying that was six years ago, that shack, when they lived in what, on the corner of the living room, and it was actually Laura's arm who was the operator at the time. Right. Okay. Now, one of you has put a guess on one of the platforms. Please don't guess on the platform, because if you do, it spoils it for everybody else, really. So if I can ask you not to guess the shack on there, at least not now for next week, if you see what I mean. Um, drop us an email to that address and then we'll, we'll be happy to um, enter you into it there. There was the address again, radio at dcpmicro.com. Okay, so let's just have a look, a look now at what's happening next week on the, uh, at the club. On uh, Sunday, of course, we've got the GB Tourist News as usual at 7 o'clock. On Monday the 3rd of May, a bank holiday, and the Monday Night Net, of course. The Monday Night Net continues to be popular with around 12 stations participating each week. 
It's a great chance for a catch up and a chat with like minded souls. The topics are varied and not always radio related, they're just generally a starting point for general banter. This Monday, we'll explore your ideal shack if money was no object. Uh, all are welcome from half past seven on Monday on GB3NB. Be there or be square. That is my words. That's Steve G3EVA who wrote that. <laughs> and he's, of course, the host of our Monday Night Net there. Half past eight, there's a CW net on 80 metres on, on most Mondays. And uh, next Wednesday, the 5th of May, NARC Live. Now, it's maybe a bit of a controversial subject. The Orsted Wind Farm Project. What does it mean for us? What does it mean for us as Norfolk residents? And most especially, of course, what does it mean for Norfolk radio amateurs? How does it affect us? Maybe those turbines won't affect your radio waves as such getting to you, but what about the possible noise from the underground cables that are going through? Well, we're going to have an expert to talk to from Orsted, and uh, they'll be on next week's NARC Live. So if you have any questions, if you have any fairly detailed questions, if you'd like to send it to me beforehand, before to this email address on there, well before next Wednesday, then of course we can put that to them, and it does give them a chance to look it up. I'm not, it doesn't, it doesn't, I, I think, help them along as such, but it just gives them some notice if it's a fairly technical question, especially that maybe they can get some research um, done before Wednesday night. So if we could say by Tuesday at the very latest, if you've got a question to put to them, otherwise, of course, they will be here live, and you'll be able to put your question live here as usual on NARC Live. And all the regulars are other stories as well. Let us know your stories. If you've got any other great creations like that keyboard, that Morse keyboard, brilliant. I think that's so good when I saw that this afternoon on my phone. Um, and uh, let us know. Just drop us a line to the usual address. And of course we have a card. Oh no. You haven't lost it's it not again, have you? No. Ah. Our NARC greeting card. We had a bit of a, oh, here we go. Just off screen. Had a bit of a busy weekend with the um, not, uh, the RSGB AGM, so we sort of cleared the decks a bit. Anyway, here it is. This is a greeting card, which we're very happy to send to anybody you feel would be cheered. They don't have to be radio amateurs. They don't have to be members of NARC or anything. Just anybody you think. This is a club card, which we sign with your name and our names, and we send it off wherever they are in the world, and it really does help cheer people up. So just let us know to that usual email address if you'd like us to send one. Now then, we come to our main event, and um, although we often have guests from far and wide here uh, coming down via Zoom or whatever, because they all have to be via Zoom at the moment, I guess, it's really nice sometimes when we can have a guest from our own ranks, as it were, and someone who I'm sure most of you know from normal club days when we meet is our special guest tonight in our Getting to Know series, and tonight we're going to get to know Donard Dick Hogan, M0KRK, so Donard, good evening. Can you hear me? We can hear you fine. Thanks for uh, thanks for your patience. I'm sorry we're a little bit later getting to you than I thought, but um, we had all sorts of things like Morse keyboards and everything else to to deal with. So how have you been? I really like that. I really like that Morse key. I thought it was brilliant, genius. I, as I said, I didn't know that he invented it, so I think he should make one now. I think that'd be <laughs> yeah. really good. So how have I you mean, been? I could, I could I could see Jim sitting there. At 28 words a minute, hitting different keys, and getting people to guess. And certainly, Chris, it would make life a lot easier for Chris not having to translate the way yes. he does yeah. from Morse to keyboard. Absolutely. In fact, of course, it might do the opposite as well. If you're good at Morse, it might make you much faster at, um, at typing. <laughs> so, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> anyway, Donald, you've got a story. I know you, you know, you've, you've shared with us some of your slides and we can see we're in for a treat tonight. Um, as I said, well, it, I said everything really in the newsletter, the, all the things that we've got coming yeah. up. So we're really looking forward to it. So, but, but do let me ask you to start at the beginning. Where did it start for Donald? Well, it started when I was extremely young. And uh, I think one of the important things that I want to communicate is just how damn lucky I feel uh, in the fact that I have been able to be uh, a curious devil and able to satisfy my curiosity most of the time. And it started here <clears throat> on Dorky Hill um, almost from the time I could walk. And Dorky Hill, I'm now standing, I took this photograph with my back to the KLY Kilo Lima Yankee Aero Beacon. And uh, I was always interested in the things around. And I knew that if I could look 
and see any cloud like that first thing in the morning, I knew the day was going to cloud over. That much I observed. When I heard the seagulls screaming, I knew there was going to be a storm. And by heavens, there would be storms here, straight in southwest the Irish Sea. It was not unusual for my family to lose maybe half a roof full of slates on a winter. Anyway, if I move to the next slide, what I'm going to do is move across from Dorky Hill to Kalani Hill. There, there's Victoria Memorial, and I'm going to look back. And to me, this is one of the hidden gems, one of the undiscovered railway journeys of the world. You leave Dublin, you travel along a, a dike, um, and then you come to Dunleary, and you travel along the old Brunel Atmospheric Railway uh, to mm. Dorky, and then you come out, and here you are above the sea for the next five miles. Incidentally, that thing there is the ferry on its way from Dunleary to Hollyhead. Now, I grew up in that environment, and uh, I think there's one person I have to blame for it all, and of course that's my father, who um, when I, even when I was very young, he had a Philips radio, one of these ones with side, didn't have pin valves, but side tab valves, and a band spread shortwave, and we would spend our time listening to shortwave radio. Um, and here is um, Donard with his dad, uh, who had an extraordinary life in his way because he left school at 13, became a an apprentice fitter in the railway, moved to the railway drawing office, became chief draftsman of the Electricity Supply Board, which is the Irish equivalent of the CEGB. Uh, when the fall of France, when the Irish army suddenly realized it had to go from 5,500 men to 55,000 men by volunteering, he volunteered because he was kept on half pay in his old job. Uh, but he was a corporal of three months, left and five, captain of the year, kept on after the war. And of course, being kept on after the war meant he uh, lost his pay from his drawing office. But he had a glass ceiling because he did not have a university degree. And this is going to be one of the things I will be coming back to later on, because he was a damned good engineer. I learned an enormous amount from him. Uh, I didn't take any of his skill, inherit any of his skills as an artist. And this is the next picture is in the 1930s. He was traveling through a railway tunnel, told there wouldn't be a train for two hours. And he was halfway through this tunnel, long tunnel, when this is what he saw. Scary. So atmospheric, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's one of my prized possessions. Uh, but normally, if you look at it, it's it's boring because you really need light under here just to highlight the smoke to give the atmosphere. Mm. Anyway, reverse engineering. I think I was about nine or ten years old when I was given this. It is not a Lewis machine gun, it's a Thornton Picard camera gun, which was used to train pilots during the First World War. And this front end here was a camera, and you, were, you the pilot, were sort of shifted round, and you had to aim at and take photographs, hopefully, of a German aircraft, uh, models of the same being waved in front of you, and not shoot down British aircraft. Anyway. I reversed engineered that destructively so there is not a single piece of it left, which is to my great shame. Sometime after that, I did learn to do reversible uh, reverse engineering <laughs> uh, or at least gather all the evidence before you go into a destructive state. Anyway, here's the other influence I had in my early life, and that is because my parents had I was the eldest of six children. My parents had children to spare. My father's sister, half-sister, had no family, but her husband was a chemical engineer in a sugar factory. So this it was a sugar factory at Tume, now gone, demolished, disappeared. But that was the factory itself. And the funny thing, I remember my uncle saying to me, yes, you live in Norfolk. There's a small sugar factory in Norfolk, a place called Cantley. Is it still there? Tume is there, Cantley, sorry, Cantley is there, Tume isn't. Mm. That was where they made, made the lime. This is where they stored the pulp. This is where they stored the sugar. Uh, or 
the interesting thing is that that much there is the pre-processing of the sugar beet and the actual turning it into sugar occupies only that space there. But for me, the key places were the workshops where there were belt driven lathes and Mr. Birmingham, who ran the stores, had a Myford lathe and he would chuck a piece of mild steel in it for me and allow this eight or nine year old to play with it. Now, this was in the days before the safety Gestapo were around. And I was told from a very early stage that safety was my responsibility. And I suppose being the eldest of six children, one spent one's time making safety assessments. But I still think that one a major problem with safety is that so much rules and regulations, um, it takes away the responsibility from the individual. But by heaven did I learn lots there. And I'll also mention that there were shunting yards all the way around this factory. And Mr. Hussey, the train driver, would pay me sixpence to shunt his locomotive, one of these, mm. while he sat at the back and read a newspaper. Mind you, shunting his loco over a way bridge was definitely a stop and go job because they all of the sugar beet wagons coming in. But for a nine, 10, 11 year old, by God, was that fun. Really? You, that's how old you were? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, how different. I could not yeah. have this experience today. Well, I don't think anybody um, could at that age. You just wouldn't be allowed to do that, would you? No, 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 you wouldn't. No, it's, it's so different. And yet, how much I gained from just being able to do these things mm. in the factory itself, looking at the centrifuges, seeing three-phase motors, discovering about star delta switching, um, how they graded sugar was amazing because there was a there was a table which was twenty yards long or so on springs with an eccentric motor that just shook the table, chunk, 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 chunk. The sugar moved down slowly, and as it moved down, all the big grains moved to the top, all the small grains moved to the bottom, and at certain places along, the big grains would be picked off, and at the very end, you had caster sugar, or sugar for making, uh, powdered sugar for making um, sort of uh, icing sugar. Mm. It was an incredible experience. Anyway, back to this. When my father retired from the Irish Army in 1962, he decided to buy a printing works. Now, he was a talented engineer and a very talented artist, but not a businessman. And printing works in those days was, within a few years, obsolete technology. But in order, he decided that the printing works was going to be in our family home. Now, the only access to the family home was there and involved getting all of the equipment up 68 steps into this large room. And it contained an Arab platen, a Thompson platen, a, um, uh, a Wharfdale cylinder machine, and my prized possession. I almost failed Ireland's equivalent of A-levels maintaining linotype machines, which I still hold to be one of the most extraordinary pieces of integrated mechanical engineering. The other cause of me for nearly failing our equivalent of A-levels was I spent the time tramping around the country with my father, uh, carrying bags of plaster of Paris as he took plaster cast copies of the megalithic carved stones. And if Peter Richmond is online, he will probably recognize that one. Um, I can still tell you that is from Newgrange, that's from Four Knox, that's from Lock Crew, and that's also from Newgrange. It was a fantastic experience, even it was very nearly a tragic outcome. However, I did get to Trinity College. And before I go to the next slide, I'll just mention that this was the days of the miniskirt. And I remember a particular young lady, red hair and very long, very beautiful legs. And on one particular day, I was walking across the front of the campus and I saw her there sitting on the grass couldn't understand why. It was only years later I realised that I was immortalised in a picture postcard. Oh, I see. That's a postcard, isn't it? Yes. That was a postcard. And that was a uh, pullover that my mother had made. And there I was tramping across 
Um, my own department was at the other end of the campus, which was a long way away. So it was fairly unusual to come up this end. So what I want to do now is just to take a few examples from uh, my undergrad, final year undergraduate studies, which I think might be relevant to you people in radio science. Every molecule has characteristics mode, characteristic modes of vibration. And I've got here the ammonia molecule. And what I've sh shown the arrows what is what I would call symmetrical stretching of the hydrogens in relation to the nitrogen. Now, the different modes are there, there, and there. But at the same time as the molecule is, vi is vibrating, the molecule is also rotating. So you can imagine that you've got a frequency here, and you've got a spectrum of frequencies, which are added to this central frequency in the sum or the difference. So it's almost like the mixing of a, a, an RF mm. and a local oscillator signal. Here's a case. I did this with Edwin Lilly. Can I just ask and, you at this stage, sorry to interrupt, but what were you studying? What did you, I don't think you mentioned what you were going to study at university. Ah, well, that, that, that'll come in the next All right, slide. Okay. Oh. Let's, well, let's just say, All right. since you've asked, I started in mathematics. Right. But mathematics at that time was pure mathematics. And I did not get on with pure mathematics. I am an applied mathematician, or at least I adore applied mathematics. I hate pure maths. Mm -hmm. So I transferred into natural sciences. And one has to be careful here, because what I really did was physical chemistry. But of course, if you're talking to someone from Trinity College Dublin, you're not supposed to say that. You're supposed to say, I, I read natural sciences. We did read, because university terms were three seven-week terms, with the examinations at the end of the long vacation. And you know, with only 21 weeks of lectures, you were given enormous heaps of things to read. Anyway, back to this, because I think this is in its way fascinating. Here is a hydrogen chloride molecule, and in far infrared, and you are seeing the individual peaks there, the absorption peaks, due to different, the vibration of the molecule at the same time as the molecule is spinning around. Now you'll notice that each of these is a double peak. And that is because that is due to the chlorine 35 isotope, and that is due to the chlorine 37 isotope. And in fact, if you go way out there beyond the picture, those peaks will start to separate. And from that separation, you can work out the mechanical strength of that chemical bond. So it's amazing what you can learn from some simple examples like that. Here's another one that looks like a looks like a current voltage characteristic because that along the bottom is the voltage. Up here was the current. And by the way, although this is over 50 watts of years old, it was only while preparing this talk I realised that there was a misprint Miss there. Missing a B, is it? Yes. <laughs> Cobalt chloride. Mm. Now, this particular thing was an electrode that contained a solution. Now, if you simply apply the voltage, very quickly that electrode would polarise, gas molecules would form other, and the current would drop. So what you did is you used a dropping mercury electrode and we had fun blowing glass, or at least, you know, twisting, heating glass tubes, and then pulling them to produce a very fine capillary and breaking it off so you've got mercury drops. Blip, blip, blip. And you had a very long RC, a time constant recorder, so that instead of getting the rise of the current and then the drop, you've got this mean current here. And what you're seeing is the oxidation potential of each one of these metals to metal iron, manganese to manganese iron, cobalt to cobalt iron. And you will notice here that the solution, the weights of material that the solution contain are here. And you can see that manganese is the biggest. And that current 
there is in effect a measure of the concentration, the relative concentration of uh, the, um, that particular component. Mm. Now, at the time, I remember Edwin and I took an old uh, thruppany, UK thruppany bit, and uh, I'm not sure if we're supposed to say that, but we dissolved it a little mm. bit in nitric acid and did this experiment, and we were able to demonstrate the particular uh, alloy components in the old thruppany bit. Don't ask me now, because I can't remember. I looked it up, but I can't remember. Can I just ask you a question? Because you did say that I could ask you questions as we went along. Yes, please do. And Tom, Tom has said one that um, might be relevant to that particular bit. He said, Tom Miller, this is, how are these gases excited for a frequency spectrum to be created? Um, oh, slope okay. is, is this absorption spectrometry tree, he said. This is indeed infrared absorption spectrometry. So what you will do is you will have a source of infrared and you will use as a monochromator a, um, a grating and that grating will very slowly uh, move thereby t give, presenting different frequencies to the sample. Hmm. Now in the case of the upper one here, what you did is you put, uh, you, you, you had a cell that had that gas in it and you had another cell which had a vacuum in it. So you get effectively a differential absorption due to the presence of that gas. So you had a kind of reference as well, is that? Yeah, yeah. indeed. Does that answer? Yes, uh, Tom Miller has just come back and said thank you with a smiley face, so yes. Oh, good, good. Right, well, here. I graduated the same day as spacemen landed on the moon and I had PhD options. I could either study the polymerization of superglue, and the answer to that was no, because I was never a tidy chemist, and even in 1969, I knew the solvents were carcinogenic. So I did a PhD in semiconductor physics. Now, um, it's interesting because, um, yeah, I'll talk about it in a second. The Irish government paid me a stipend of 400 pounds a year, Trinity College waived my fees, and that was okay, but um, wasn't quite enough, so I went teaching at night school. And the trouble was, I thought I knew everything about physics. And when you sit or stand in front of a class of 60 people and suddenly discover that you don't understand the physics you are trying to teach. Now, that was probably one of the most important baptisms of fire I ever had. It was nerve-wracking at the time, but I think it has benefited my teaching ever since. Right, first postdoc, University of Nijmegen in Holland. And I took several postdocs, and the reason was that my PhD supervisor had got his lectureship in Trinity, Dublin, before he finished his PhD. And he didn't have the breadth of experience. I was his third ever PhD student and his first to finish. So there we are in Nijmegen using liquid helium to measure, there's a magnet there, to measure Hall effects in silicon at liquid helium temperatures because this was Philips making their own silicon crystals and they believed that there was oxygen inclusions. Now, I won't say much more about it because my feeling was it was an interesting experience for me. What did I contribute to the learning there? Not a lot. However, the year after, things started to change. I went to Birmingham University, where I was asked to fabricate. Now, talk about a bullshit, Richard. Can you fabricate microwave uh, diodes? Oh, yes, 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 sure. All right. Anyway, the Barrett diode was an extremely interesting device, newly invented, and it consisted a symmetrical P N P junction. Now, it didn't matter which of these you reverse biased. If you reverse biased that junction, then the depletion layer moved across. And as the depletion layer moved across, nothing happened until the depletion layer hit there, at which point carriers would be injected and there would be current flowing. You could reverse it and its current would flow in the opposite direction. However, if you bias this 
to about 70 volts or so, and then apply an ORF or put it in a resonant cavity that will happen itself, you can get a situation where you get an ORF signal here, which just pushes the depletion layer across. You get an injection of charge, and as that charge is moving, transiting through the depletion layer, hence transit time, the polarity of the RF signal has changed. You've got a negative resistance, therefore a source of microwave energy. Now, it took me about two years or so to develop this technology, and these are the steps that are involved, starting off with a one-inch diameter slice, going through the processing steps, down to a MESA diode there. And here's a picture of the MESA diode with the bonds. And I'll tell you that if I did any drinking the night before, I couldn't put those dyes into the, into the header. There would be too much shake in my hands, even through micro, <laughs> micro manipulators. What, what age were you now, roughly? Were you in your early uh, 20s or mid 20s now? Don't that was, uh, let's see, um, I was about 28. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. And I know people are supposed to be able to hold their alcohol at 28, but you know. Mm, well, I, I did wonder, that's why I was. <laughs> no, but I was just trying to picture, you know, I know what it was like. I lived in Cambridge for many years and. I saw what students, uh, what ages they were drinking from and to, and, yes. and it was it was getting less serious when you were in the late twenties. Put it like that. <laughs> well, I, the thing is, I, I never entered contests because I, I I was a permanent loser in the in the how fast and how much could you drink contest. <laughs> right. Anyway, since oh, if I processed one of these slides, so I could produce two and a half thousand devices. Now, in terms of the university research. They only needed half a dozen to evaluate them, or maybe a dozen. So what I took to doing was taking the one-inch slice and slowly dropping it into a slow silicon etch, which would remove part of the epitaxial layer. So instead of having a 10 micrometer epitaxial layer, it might be something more like a 5 micron epitaxial layer, right up to 10 on that side. So when I processed the slice, the devices around here would be suitable for microwave applications. And I had a range of devices whose punch through voltage was much higher and a range of devices whose punch through voltage was much slower, lower. So having done that, the next question was, OK, so what could you use them for? And here we are, and I will have, this shows you on the oscilloscope with a typical case that was 20, 40, 60, 80, 75 volts switch on, perfect for microwave applications. But down at the other end, here is a typical um, punch through diode chip. And I discovered that if I could control, carefully control, externally control the current through that device, then it could provide me a constant voltage source over at least 100 degrees. And if I took another one with a different breakdown voltage, I could get a different um, constant voltage sources. And it's very interesting the way that at low um, current, the voltage drops with temperature. At higher current, the voltage rises with temperature. And I'll come back to that in just a second. A colleague, Theo van der Rohe from the University of Eindhoven, um, elucidated that mechanism with numerical modeling. And I'm going to step ahead because Susan John was a student of mine at Nottingham University uh, who helped me destroy these, blow them up. And I'll talk about that a lot in a few minutes. But I want you to notice that if you're you know, trying to blow these up, with several hundred volts. Now, either you can have the reverse voltage here or the reverse voltage here. And you can see the reverse voltage here has the device a lot closer to the heat sink than if it's here. And one of the things we found was that the destruction, the, the sort of voltage, destructive voltage 
uh, was very dependent on which polarity you used. Also, you can use this graph to explain the mechanism of destruction. Because when Susan first destroyed these devices, she came back to me, I looked under the microscope and I can find no burn holes. So I told her to go away and drop the slice into a silicon etch, knowing that the silicon etch would etch faster through polysilicon than single crystal silicon. Polysilicon would be where there was a melt hole. And true enough, she came back to me with a device that looked more like a sponge. Reason? This is a self-protecting device. Because if you have a situation where you have a high voltage, um, what happens is um, as it starts to carry current, uh, the, because the voltage is constant, if it's getting hot, it says, look, I don't, want, I don't want this current. Somewhere else have it. And another piece of the same device would say, no, I don't want it. Somewhere else would have it. So all of the sort of overcurrent would be squeezed into a little area. So regions, and you've got these burn holes where eventually they reached about 350, 400 degrees centigrade and you got an intrinsic conduction. Anyway, at the time I was there uh, in Birmingham doing this work, I was a resident tutor in a hall of residence. And this, after I left, they demolished it and replaced it by um, Bijou uh, residences. But that was the boys' residence. This was just after, you know, the after the sort of transfer from the age of uh, majority to uh, from 18 to 21. This and over here were the girls' residence. I tell people that I lived in that flat in charge of 35 young ladies with a wife firmly in charge of me. <laughs> right. I moved to Buxton because I was working at Mullard Hazel Grove. And at the time I moved to Buxton, I joined the Burbage Silver Prize Band because up to that time I had been an orchestral trumpet player, but really did not want to compete with these quiz kids playing cornet. So that's me with a baritone horn. And um, I tell people that the baritone horn is the pa of a band. So when the rest of the band is going oom, I'm going pa, oom, pa, oom, pa. But there came a point at which I told them I was about to leave to go to work at Nottingham University. And they put me, um, they transferred me from the baritone horn to the E-flat bass. I wanted them to put me on the B-flat bass, but they refused. I don't know if people can hear. Wives had a very important part. My wife took that recording. Okay. And the main responsibility that a wife had was to keep the pint pot. When we took over a pub on a Saturday night, the responsibility was to keep the, your pint pot full at all times. And as they used to say up in books, and that if wife comes between thee and banding, wife goes. <laughs> anyway. Can you imagine, I, I wanted to play the, the B-flat bass, but they refused because given my stature, if I had been marching and playing, all you would have seen was two little feet <laughs> under the B-flat bass. <laughs> anyway, moved to Nottingham University where I was the acting warden in a hall of residence, sorry, I was first deputy warden in a hall of residence and later acting warden. And incidentally, those people who know Tony Kent um, who chairs the Examination Standards Committee of the RSGB, uh, he took, had the same role about 10 years after me. Now, this time I was very socialist-minded and didn't want to sort of lord it over people. So instead of sitting in the centre of my hall, I'm sitting there. Um, there was a really nice bunch. This guy, Murali Ramachandran, uh, he would say to Murali, can I get you some coffee? Yeah, yes, yeah, sure. What colour? He'd look at you and say, me colored. <laughs> right. The work I did in the department, however, was quite different. 
Having been totally underemployed at Mullard Hazel Grove, where I had time to make lots and lots of power punch through diodes, now is my chance to build equipment to blow them up. So that's on the right here, uh, sorry, the other right, the left, uh, I have got a typical Marx generator, but instead of spark gaps, we use power MOSFETs. Now, we had great difficulty getting those power MOSFETs at the time, mm. because there was rumors that Saddam Hussein wanted them for igniters for his nuclear weapons. The other interesting thing here is the capacitors, which all had to be very low inductance capacitors in order to be able to get very short pulses. Did you still have a connection with Philips at this time, by the way? Uh, I just about. Hmm. Yeah, I'm still on good terms with them. Okay. But, you know, it petered out because the people moved on and I moved on. But what I will say here is that um, the reason I wanted very short pulses was Philips equipment for pulse testing devices was in the order of tens of microseconds, which means that the heat generated in the device was actually getting out into the header, into the package. So it was dependent on the quality of the torquing down of the package onto whatever heat sink. I wanted to know what was the punishment withstand capability of a punch through diode when used as a transient suppressor. So I was looking for things like half microsecond pulses. My student, Stephen Vardigan, is a great guy, built this bipolar device here. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you can see it's a three stage. So you've got a negative pulse first, and you can see the three stages of the different um, MOSFETs switching on one after the other. The system we used to measure was like this. The device under test was channel two in a storage oscilloscope, fast storage oscilloscope. And that was the, the voltage of the device under test. The difference across this resistor was the current across the device under test. Stephen came back to me one day and said, look, I'm having terrible problems because every time I use a metal film resistor, uh, it burns out. If I use a carbon film resistor, I've got no problems. But a metal film resistor burns. So, okay, let's strip off the, the paint off the resistor and have a look. And we looked here and carefully saw this. And we proved it wasn't an inductive effect. And this led me to think that the substrate on which, how they make these is they coat them first, and then they use a laser to burn away the metal to the required resistance. And the material, the insulating material underneath is called molite, which is a mixture of aluminium oxide and silicon dioxide. And that molite has a thermal conductivity which rises with temperature. Rises, drops. Thermal resistivity, which rises with temperature. So if this place here starts to get hot, its ability to dissipate heat drops. And therefore it gets hotter and therefore fails. And this led me into a completely new area, namely thin film electric fuses. And we deposited electric fuses. That's the, the active element of electric fuse there. We deposited them onto different insulating substrates, silica, alumina, beryllia. We have to be a bit careful with beryllia. And my colleague, Paul Webb at Birmingham University, for whom I used to make microwave diodes, did the thermal imaging for me. And this shows this not particularly stunning result in this, but it's the only one I have left. But I had a, another PhD student, Ao Inameti, who actually embedded thermocouples underneath these here. So what he would do is he, he would first put in microthermocouples then a, a layer of insulating material, a tiny layer of insulating material over this, so that as the fuse was working, um, carrying current, like more current, you could use, you could measure the temperature using thermocouples, so that even if that fuse was embedded in some other material that I'll come across in a minute, you could still monitor it. 
Right. At about the same time, I came under the influence of this rather extraordinary man called Peter Johns, who had been a microwave engineer at the post office Dollis Hill, who invented this system called transmission line matrix modeling. His philosophy was to take any physical problem and replace the physical problem by an analog comprising of um, lengths of transmission line. Now, his argument was is that if you created an accurate analog of the physical problem, then this mesh matrix of transmission lines could be solved exactly. So instead of the numerical inaccuracies being in the in mathematical processing, it was instead in the description of the analog. Uh, sadly, he died very young. And there's a great loss. But when he was introducing me to this, I took, I became his, he might say, disciple in heat flow modeling because I needed to use it. Now, this may not look very convincing, but the first thing I've got you to see, need you to see, is here is two pieces of um, transmission line. They could be sort of, you know, ordinary uh, lattice line cross-section there, and the current is r related to the, the magnetic field. This setup will measure the magnetic field in the x and y direction while measuring the electric field in the z direction. So in this case, I've got to, to imagine that I have inserted resistors in here, as shown here, and this is a three-dimensional model. And you can see that if I tried to show the other part of the transmission line, it would become impossible to visualize. But you can do a three-dimensional heat flow model using that setup there. And that is exactly what we did with uh, Mohammed Hanini, whose name I see has disappeared off this. Uh, so let's not worry. But here we have a thin film electric fuse uh, with a micron of silver on alumina substrate and pumping 29 amps through it our model predicts that in 10 nanoseconds the temperature rises like this because the thermal resistivity of alumina increases its thermal conductivity drops as it gets hotter this is the exact opposite of what happens with alumina with silica Silica, glass, becomes a better thermal conductor as it gets hotter. So here, instead of one micron, we have 2.2 microns of silica, silver on a silica substrate, carrying 24, 28, 32, 36 amps, and it reaches a stable temperature. So why then do electric fuses have sand in them? Because you would think that if this is the way it's going to behave, that's the last thing you would have. Mm -hmm. And I came up with this hypothesis um, that nobody's ever contested. But what happens is here is the electric arc. And as the electric arc is burning, the silver is burning back and the silver vapor is going out through the sand particle. And it so happens that the silver vapor transfers its thermal energy to the, to the sand. It causes the sand to melt. And if the sand melts to form a balloon around the conductor, then the pressure, the gas pressure inside, rises. So the main free path between collisions drops and suddenly you can no longer support an electric arc. The sand balloon quenches the electric arc. But just occasionally, uh, if it burns back far enough before it attempts to quench, you get this. That is the pressure that has built up in here, blowing out through the sidewall of the electric fuel. And God help anyone who happened to be in the vicinity when that happened. Right, some
some of you may have played with metal oxide baristas. And one of the things you will notice with a metal oxide barista is that you can get an overshoot. So a barista is supposed to switch on uh, when you get an over voltage, but you get, you can sometimes get an overshoot. So what I want to show you here is the equipment that Stephen Vardigan has built, we use to get an entire current voltage char characteristic from a single pulse measurement. Here you have a pulse, which is channel one um, in the oscilloscope. Here is channel two in the oscilloscope. That is the voltage across the device under test. The difference is the current across the device under test, which you can then plot. But one of the things that Mark Leeson and I noticed, uh, he was an undergraduate project student, by the way, but one of the things we noticed, that depending on the DVDT, the rate of rise of the pulse, you've got completely different characteristics. So that is 40 volts per microsecond up to 150 volts per microsecond. And I haven't seen that um, noted anywhere else, but it's well worth considering if you are pulse stressing your uh, MOV with high, with, you know, sort of um, very high rise pulses, you better derate it. Anyway, that was the fun I had between 1989 and 2006, when I arrived, sorry, no, hold on, I got it wrong. 1988, December 1988, I left Nottingham University. January 89, I started at UEA and wasn't there long when I was appointed Deputy Senior Resident Tutor, responsible for all of the students in Norfolk Terrace, Suffolk Terrace. But at that time, I had a team of resident tutors. About 2003, I had long sort of, you know, relinquished that job, but about 2003, I was asked to take on an alternative role. As the disciplinary officer, and I have got to say that of all the jobs I have ever had, this is the one I have probably enjoyed the most. Now, you might think, you know, God, is this guy a sadist? <laughs> no, not really. I mean, I remember one day being in, my wife and I being in the Wagamama in Norwich when one of the waitresses said, I know you. You're the disciplinary officer. I said, was. I'm retired. But she said, you, 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 you had to see me about something, and uh, it was the most important lesson I ever had. But anyway, more than once, I mean, two stories. To a student, I'm writing to you to inform you that climbing a crane, a contractor's crane on campus is against university regulations. <laughs> Doing so while drunk is extremely dangerous. Doing so while drunk and naked in February is bloody madness. <laughs> Please don't do it again. <laughs> the other one was, you have been extremely rude to that security man. I was drunk. Oh, so you're a real bastard. What do you mean? Well, you're claiming the in vino veritas defense. What does that mean? In wine, the truth. <laughs> so, is that really the person you are? I'll tell you what, I'm fining you £50. But there is a way out. The university hated me for this. There's a way out. If you write a letter of apology to that security man, if I approve the letter of apology, then you will deliver that letter to the security man together with a bottle of whiskey, and I will close the book. No student ever passed up that opportunity, and the university hated me because they didn't get the fine money into their base income. <laughs> right. Uh, while at UVA, they didn't have the facilities that, you know, or the experimental facilities that we had uh, at Nottingham. So I was then into lots of different forms of modeling. And this modeling was uh, largely due to Dorian Hindmarsh. This was a form of acoustic modeling. But before I just run it, I'm going to draw your attention to the fact that you have here a wave, a pulse, which is about, oh, there's no point in me pointing. No, You're we, about to have a pulse, okay. which oh, comes in better. here. Yes. Right. And as it comes in here, you will see that it's traveling 
in a region of constant impedance. When it arrives here, the impedance drops. So you will see a reflected pulse from there, a negative reflected pulse. Meanwhile, when the pulse arrives here, the impedance, which was low, now increases again, and you'll get a positive pulse here. So I want you to note the negative pulse on this side and the positive pulse on that side. I'll run the simulation now. We'll see if we can, if we necessarily run it again. Here's the negative pulse coming now. Here's the positive pulse coming now. And you will see the way the signal wobbles down that piece of waveguide. Now, there are all sorts of artifacts there because, of course, we have a finite sized computer. And we, uh, you know, to get a really accurate model, you have to have it infinitely long. Now, the next example I want to. Can I just before you leave that slide? Yeah, please do. Because I'm, I know I have seen this uh, briefly the other day when we did the rehearsal, but. Can you just explain exactly what we're looking at there, Donald? Uh, uh, um, uh, Don, just you know, to the basics, because we've got people of varying interests and levels of knowledge on engineering and things. Okay. So, can you just tell us exactly what right. we're looking at there? Well, let's let's take this. Did you mention as, a waveguide, didn't you? Yeah, I mentioned a waveguide, but let's call it an acoustic tube. Okay. An organ tube, in which you <clears throat> put an impulse in. Mm -hmm. And as the impulse is traveling along, it is in a region of constant impedance. Okay. However, when it arrives there, mm -hmm. the space represents a drop in impedance. And part of the signal, we know that part of the signal is going to go, sorry, I'm pointing in, we know that part of the signal is going to go down there, and part of the signal is going to continue. And how does this separate out? And the answer is because this is a, if you like, this is Z naught, this is Z T. Then the wave goes on, that's Z naught and that's Z T. In this case, Z T is less than Z naught, so you get a negative reflection coefficient. Here, Z T is greater than Z naught, and you get a positive. I'll show it again. With Z being the impedance? Z being the impedance. There's the negative wave going back. Here's the positive wave coming down the tube. Now, I had to limit the number of things I could show you. But an example uh, of that which was done by Mike Morton is the C, a sound pulse tsunami in the C, is equivalent to a, a half, a quarter wave in a waveguide. The C is a waveguide. The C bed is a solid surface. The reflection coefficient is one. The C surface is a short circuit, reflection coefficient minus one. And what you can see, um, and, and uh, Mike Morton has simulated this, you can see the way in which the waves wobble along um, between the seabed and the sea surface. It's very impressive, but I did have to limit myself to what I could show you. That's all right. uh, otherwise, we'd thank, be here thank you for that. Thanks for elaborating. Okay, now Mike Morton did this work because we had another student called David Peel, who sadly died before he finished his MSc. As an undergraduate, he'd had an idea for his final year project. He had been a trainer for air sea rescue pilots. And he wanted to use the noise from the rotor tips of a helicopter to be able to tell the pilot where the pilot was in relation to an obstruction. So there's a rotor tip there. Here's an obstruction. Can the pilot move in any closer? So we're looking above a helicopter model. You're looking above yeah. a helicopter. Right. It's a four blade helicopter. Uh, we're looking above it, and down here we're going to see a response here, which has been received by a microphone at the rotor center. Now, if you're standing here, you will hear a Doppler effect because of the rotors passing you by. But if you are here at the center, you will not hear a Doppler effect. 
So if we run this simulation, which was done by Mike Morton, you'll see the rotors turning, and you'll see the signals hitting the obstruction, coming back into the microphone and being reflected and being received by the microphone. Now, isn't that impressive? Mm -hmm. And if you know, if you have a device which tells you where the micro, where the rotor is, and you can time the return signal, then you should be able to tell how far you are away from the obstruction. So this a matter of safety that normally a helicopter, I guess, would avoid that sort of thing. But if you're in a life and death situation trying Correct. to rescue, you really want to push it to the limit. And this is a, a system. So, and when was this? What, what, what sort of time? Uh, was this? this would have been about 2003, four. Uh, Mike would probably be able to confirm that maybe a little bit, mm. maybe 2004, five. And has but it been David, adopted? He, no, no, no. Look, no. I just generate ideas. Oh. But the, the idea here was that the pilot should have on oh. his dashboard, on his sort of screens, a device which might only be a whole lot of colored LEDs to show him how close he was. David Peel had demonstrated the fact that if there was a cliff face here and there was an obstruction like a tree, uh, he could get his helicopter in under the tree because he could detect a, an obstruction 15 degrees wow. above the, 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 the plane of the rotors. Um, when we showed it to MOD, they said, what the hell are you doing that for? We are trying to make rotor, our rotors quieter. <laughs> so really nobody's anyway. taken, nobody has taken it up as an interest in, in commercial, no? Now, now, David, there's an idea for you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Or anybody else who wants well, absolutely. To. It's not really up my street, but, um, yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, my, my feeling is um, I, I just generate ideas. I'm delighted if other people take them up and run with them. Yes, as you mentioned actually to me earlier, and Nev has now put on to BATC where he's watching this, he said that, uh, for your information, I've brought Mike Morton to several NARC events. And he often joins me on the fox hunts that we do. So, yeah. yeah. That's... Well, I'm coming back to my dad because I remember him telling me when I was very small that a military engineer would never detonate a, an explosive if the Met officers had told him there was going to be a temperature inversion. Because his comment was, uh, it may not affect people close by, but people five miles away might not, might have all of their windows blown out. So I use this modeling technique um, to create a temperature inversion in the vertical. So here is a horizontal, here's a vertical, and here's a source, which is generating a sine wave. And I am looking at the propagation of that sine wave into a medium, which has got a change of velocity as you move upwards. And what are we seeing? We are seeing a region of absolute quietness and then a region of sound again. There you are, the region of sound, region of quietness. Now, if I had enough time and computing power, I would do that simulation for hundreds and hundreds, thousands of different frequencies. I would then take all the data. I would then do an inverse Fourier transform for the data collector of that position or that position. And I firmly believe that I would be able to generate the sound of a thunder rumble. Anyway, oh. if you think this is Codswallop, here is two pieces from an old uh, meteorology book. A uh, thousand kilograms <clears throat> of German explosives that were destroyed post uh, the Treaty of Versailles. And they were blown up here. And here you have the regions of no sound, no boom, no boom, boom, and so on. And the same thing on the 26th of June. So my dad was right. Uh, you've got to be awfully careful on how you expose, uh, you know, detonate your explosives. Mm. Because you might get, or the Ministry of Defense will get massive claims for broken windows. Right, I'm on to safety. 
Because in 2006, I retired from EUEA, went to Shanghai, where I arrived, bleary-eyed, the boss said, can you teach C++? And this bullshit merchant said, of course I can. Now, I've got to say, I know nothing about C++, but I'm married to someone who used to teach it. No, she provided me with the material. But when I arrived at this college, this is what presented itself. Do you consider that a safe situation? Not without a handrail on the other side, no. Yeah. <laughs> now, Especially just, if it was crowded. Just out of the picture is a guy with his welding kit. And he's welding in the new part, the parts for the new um, handrails. But his welding kit is sitting in the middle there. The wires for the welding kit come up the stairs, across the landing, and into um, into a plug, which is held in with two chopsticks. You know, we uh, in this country we talk about a, a brine a plug. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the equivalent. <laughs> and I lived my flat was about half an hour's walk away. Uh, and there was an old Maoist type um, accommodation, very pleasant. Uh, they put me on floor four. Why do they do that? Because um, the numbers in Chinese are E, R, San, Su. Now, Su is the set four, is the same as the word for death. So the ch <laughs> Su, four, is an unlucky number in, in China. So they put the bloody foreigners on floor four. And here I am, outside, and I can't believe what I'm seeing because these here are the electric power lines supplying the accommodation. And I saw people with bamboos, with a hook on the end of the bamboo, hanging mm. up their washing. I'm not joking. I think that, right. like live wires there. there it, I go to... Just fully live wires. Well, I suppose it would have dried yes, the clothes quite quickly. Fully live wires. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I prefer not to. But look, no. if you think that's bad, there's another case here. Because between my flat in Colombo and the college where I taught, again, about a 20-minute walk, um, there was a, a site being demolished and rebuilt. And you'll see these guys using oxyacetylene cutting. And I'm not joking. Not only this guy, but that guy is wearing sandals. Mm. Yeah? Mm. Now, this is a view from the roof of my flat. That's looking north towards uh, Colombo Harbour. The college was just in there off the picture. But what I wanted to show you is that Colombo is 6.9 degrees north. So, for some part of the year, I would go up on the roof and watch the sun rise in the east, go round by the south, and settle in the west. At other times of the year, I will watch the sun rise in the east, go round by the north, and set in the west. But on the 4th of April of the year I was there, I went up onto the roof of the college, and took this photograph, and that is the handrail around the roof of the college, and you will see the shadow shows that the sun is absolutely directly above us. Hmm. It was bloody awful hot, but I was determined to get that photograph. Hmm. Right. Further safety. I looked out the back window of my apartment block, and for a long time there was this flat roof, and then I saw they were doing some things, and they put a wall around it. Yeah, okay, fine. Yeah, nothing too strange there. Then I noticed the, they would put little holes in the brickwork and these bits of wood were sticking out. Why? Because they couldn't put a scaffolding here because that was an adjacent property. So these here was the auto scaffolding and I have another photograph of five blokes standing on that scaffolding as they were rendering that brickwork. I just could not believe it. And we worry about safety here, and that's what we have to deal with. So I now <laughs> come to the washout. 
I come to the washout because for a long time I have been involved with the UK Engineering Council through the IET, registration for CENG and IENG. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that my father had hit a glass ceiling because he didn't have a degree. Now, I was at the meeting in Central Hall, Westminster, where we hammered out the whole question of changes to CENG and IENG registration to move away from mere qualifications to a registration system based on competence. And if you like, my insistence and my continued doing of uh, interviews for the IET is based on my determination to try and do for other people what society at the time did not do for my father. As I said, he and I spent a lot of time listening to uh, radio the old shortwave broadcasts and would occasionally uh, hear Morse broadcasts. 2012, cancer, and given all the cancers that I could have had, I've got to say it was, um, I was lucky. And the actual process of the cure and so on was uh, a very interesting one. I owe my thanks to an awful lot of people including Steve Nichols' wife, who spent a lot of time inserting um, sort of um, implants, hormone implants, which helped keep me alive. Uh, but I decided if I was going to be spending something like 40 sessions sitting around on hospital waiting rooms, I was going to learn Morse code. Now, if ever there was... <laughs> A dis you might say a, a, dif a difference between sort of what you'd like to do and what actually happened. Because what I didn't realize is all of the other blokes there waiting for their radiotherapy formed a social grouping. So I never got any Morse code done. And that is one of the reasons why I joined you guys. <laughs> and I've got to that. say thank you to, I've got to say thank you to everyone who helped me along the way. And particularly to those who helped teach me Morse code. And I know for the last year other things have kept me away, but I promised to get back to it. I'm still going, and probably, unlike some of the stratospheric people, I can probably do about 27 words a minute now. Quite happy oh, with that. No. Uh, but it's very interesting, because I think Morse is quite a difficult language. Now, recognizing dots and dashes is one thing, but trying to recognize entire words without translating in your mind as you have to do if you're doing other languages, that is quite a challenge. And I would say Morse is quite a difficult language. So when Peter Richmond took ill, I sorry, shortly after I got my qualifications, Peter Richmond uh, invited me onto the exams group. And when he took ill, I, uh, I took over the chair of the exams group. And um, so far as I'm concerned, uh, the exams group is payback for everything I've got. Um, I want to be fair to everybody. Uh, I want, uh, you know, okay, I want you to be competent. My teaching is entirely teaching by understanding rather than simply by the accumulation and memorizing of information. And uh, just to let you know that right through lockdown, myself and my excellent team, which includes Peter, I have been meeting twice a week um, to hammer through um, keeping our exams up to date, doing the direct to full um, syllabus, which has been out and uh, the feedback is now with us and we're digesting it prior to coming up with the final revisions. And of course, we are now trying, basically what we're trying to do is make the syllabus a living thing, so we're not still teaching verbs. Much to my chagrin, we have already dropped semiconductors. But maybe that's the way radio is going, and we've got to go with it. I mean, don't I, just well, for everybody's sake, because there are several different departments in the RSGB that deal with their various different levels of the training and the exams. Can you just elaborate exactly what your particular group does that you're chair okay, of? Right. Uh, I should say that we are in a, an interesting limbo group um, between, we're in a limbo group between Ofcom and the RSGB. 
because if you like, through we answer to the examination standards committee. We are a group, but we answer to the examination standards committee, basically who have to dance the tune as defined by Ofcom. So we're a little different to many of the groupings within the RSGB. What do we do? Um, quite a lot of work. We spend a lot of time <clears throat> looking at the suitability of the syllabus and updating it. The su suitability of examinations, because remember, it only requires the IET wire wiring regulations to change, uh, and we have to change that. Uh, somebody decides that the definition of um, low watermark changes, and that changes not only what's in the syllabus, uh, determining maritime mobile, but also determines what's in the um, what's in the, the examination. The exam, yeah. And we do have to change the exams. Now, the other thing we do is we field challenges because we will acknowledge that try as we may, we don't always get examination questions correct. There are examination questions that have ambiguities. There are examination questions that are sometimes wrong, have misprints, and if a candidate feels that they have experienced such, they are welcome to challenge us. And the rule we operate is that if even one member of our group, the ESRG, the Examination Standards um, Group, um, examination, examination, yes, examination Syllabus Review Group, mm -hmm. if we get even one member of the group dissenting, then a challenge is upheld. So we don't get that many, uh, but I want to assure people that if a challenge comes in, we do our best to treat it sympathetically. And although I don't want to invite people to challenge if it's not necessary, it is part of our quality control mechanism in which everyone participates, and for which I'm extremely grateful. David, that's it. Well, what a story. Where do I start? I think we ought to start just because of, you've done that, and we've got a few questions, by the way. Um, just to f sort of almost finish the, the RSGB bit, because as uh, many of you will know, if you, especially if you saw the AGM in the weekend, you'll know how many people have taken. It's 3,300, I think it was. Tammy, I believe. 3,300 yep. people have taken exams. So a lot more than in normal times. Has that put extra pressure on you, you and your group because so many people have taken them and they've taken them online on their own without maybe a club environment around them? I think that a lot... We don't get as many challenges as I thought we might get. We have a lot of people saying, you know, I'm appealing my exam. Yeah, okay, well, what are you appealing about? Well, I, I, I didn't pass it. And we look at how they have done, and we realize that perhaps they have not been successful simply because they have not had the benefit of the clubs, uh, helping them along, tutoring them, mentoring them. And, you know, I try to write to everyone who writes, who makes a challenge, and, you know, it is very nice to say we have upheld your challenge and your marks have been, you know, uh, adjusted accordingly or we have upheld your challenge. Your, mark has been, your marks have been changed and I'm glad to see you've now passed. Yes. But I... equally we get cases of, look, we're awfully sorry and we feel that with a little mentoring you will do a lot better in the future. Mm, so you're trying to be helpful and constructive with it. It's good. By the way, I just mentioned for people at home, not not for you to worry about, Donard, but there is a little bit of a problem on the sound feed between Donard and us, so that will obviously be reflecting onto everybody at home now. Uh, just occasionally we're missing the odd word or something, Donard, so just forgive us for that. It's just the, the technology between us, I guess. Um, got a few questions and comments, though, uh, John, in no particular order. John G8VPE says, I'm fairly sure that I studied HND with Steve Vardigans at Norwich City College. Does that mean anything to you? Yes, yes, I believe you would. He would have, yes. Yeah. Okay. Haven't, heard, uh, haven't heard of Stephen for years, but, of course, at that time, 
Um, at that time, being sort of totally ensconced in Nottingham, I was unaware of him and Norwich City College. Right. But I must check with Keith Webster. Um, I think that is absolutely true. Um, Stephen was an absolute wizard at electronics. Yes. Um, Mark Tuttle has said, wow, an AVO 8, and I know what he means by that. That's that thing on the shelf, and the top shelf, yep. Yep, just above your right left ear. Yep. And it, the other one there is a Wayne Care Universal Bridge. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's the way you used to have to measure things, isn't it? Measure components yep. and test components. Well, um, I tell people, these days, you don't bother about the front. You just open it up and look admiringly at the inside at the absolute superiority of British engineering as yeah. it was. Well, I think you were, you were obviously at home waiting to come on earlier, but did you see the construction in that Omega radio that Paul showed? I mean, extraordinary talent and um, skill to make something that dense and that neat as well. Incredible. Um, we had a few people, I didn't mention it at the time because I didn't want to stop your flow when you were explaining that was the sort of what I'd call a back-to-back -back diode. Um, a couple of people, Tom said, is that a tunnel diode? And Simon said, a gun diode. So was it one or both of those? No, it was neither. A tunnel diode uh, is a rather specific device which has a current voltage, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can draw it. It has a current voltage characteristic a bit like that. Right. And it, it involves having a very narrow junction. Um, a gun diode uh, ha, is quite different and involves gallium arsenide. This is much the Barrett diode was B-A-R-I-T-T. The T-T stands for transit time. And another diode at that time was called a Trapat diode. Wow. But I was working for the man who invented the Barrett's diode. Yeah. That's a new one on me, I must admit. I haven't heard, I haven't heard of that. I've, uh, going back to my college days, I've certainly heard of tunnel diodes, and obviously Zener diodes, which are, are very common yeah. and that sort of thing. But um, The thing that killed it at the time, uh, David, was the fact that power electronics hadn't developed. Hmm. And where you could drive a gun diode from 12 volts, um, a 12-volt battery, and okay, it was dirty, it was dirty microwave source. This was an extremely clean microwave source, but you needed 70 to 80 volts. Yes. And at that time, people didn't readily get high voltages. The power electronics didn't exist to give you high voltages from, let's say, a car battery. Yeah. Yeah, you couldn't get the, from the 12 volts, you wouldn't be able to get those high voltages, yeah. I guess. It was a device before its time. Yeah. Uh, Phil um, G6AIO says, don't argue, you've taken me back to my days at Portsmouth Poly doing applied chemistry. So he obviously relates to what you, some of the things you said. You've mentioned, I mean, there's always different places you've lived as well, not just in Ireland and the UK, but other places. You know, languages, that must be a thing with you. How many languages do you have? Irish, I'm pretty bad at. Really? Uh, I passed it. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good to me. Well, I'll come back to it. <laughs> um, Dutch. I learned Dutch early on because of a pretty girl. Um, so I, 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 but in fact, most of my Dutch was learned not in, um, not in Holland when I went there, <clears throat> but the, the Dutch paid us so well. My wife went back to Dublin the following year, did an MSc in Dublin. I was in Birmingham University on my own, went to the language laboratory at night, and I use the language tapes. Now, the Irish language has a high level of gutturality. In ha, ha, ha. If, I, if I cite a particular poem in Irish, it goes, and so on. But if you can speak with a Northern Ireland accent, you know the people in Northern Ireland speak funny like that. Well, the first lines of the tape in the Birmingham University, the Dutch language tape was, so the intonation is there. And in fact, many of the languages I follow, uh, I do so for the intonation. Um, Chinese, I was working there and I had a 25-year-old sadist um, teaching me. And by God, she 
you know, she really did a good job. The last six weeks I was there, I was her only student, and I had to come into her class and speak for one and a half hours in Chinese. Oh, goodness. No There's, English. There was nowhere to hide if you were the only student. Exactly. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Um, then after the radiotherapy treatment, uh, I found I was desperately in need of sunshine, and my wife organized me to travel to near Huelva in the south of Spain. In fact, those who know about the man who never was at Operation Mincemeat, our hotel was directly in front of where the body of that gentleman was washed ashore. Hmm. Anyway, while there, I decided I was going to learn Swedish. Why? Because many years ago, I watched the film Elvira Madigan and thought that was a beautiful sounding, accent, sounding voice. Now, you can gather that I enjoy different accents. You heard me do, doing my infamous Derbyshire accent. <laughs> uh, I could do most of the accent in Ireland. I still can't do, never could do a Birmingham accent, even though I was there for three years. And don't ask me to try. <laughs> Scott's accent, I can do a Billy Connolly any time. Anyway, um, after that, after Swedish, I thought, ah, I'll learn Portuguese. And, you know, I'm getting old now. Come on. How many more languages are we going to do? So exactly. I've started doing Finnish. Huh. And that is hopefully the Finnish. <laughs> Finnish is the Finnish. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. And Morse. Oh, and Morse, of course. Yeah, we must have forgotten oh, Morse. Now, I would, I, I would put Morse as um, if I take, um, oh, let's see, I'd put Morse somewhere... You know, if I said Swedish and Dutch are easy languages, I'd put Morse next before things like Finnish. And I've got problems with Portuguese because I the sounds are nice, but people tend to lose sounds. I keep getting wrong marks for uh, missing out things simply because I don't hear them. Um, but yeah, Morse, I would say, is... Up at that level of that, that will that will please the Roger and um, Jim and all those who teach the Morse uh, in this area, I'm sure, because I thought you were going to say it was just below, say, uh, Chinese or something like that. So, uh, so, so no, no. Although I've got to say, Chinese is very simple because although Chinese writing is a lifetime study, spoken Chinese, so long as you get the intonation correct. I mean, there is a certain word in Chinese. I will not ask, I would not when I was there, ask my secretary if, for the loan of a pencil. Because if I got the intonation correct, um, I would get a pencil. If I got the intonation wrong, I would get slapped around the face for an improper <laughs> suggestion. I had a horrible feeling you were going to say something like that. Well, I'm not going to ask you to repeat that bit here. Um, no. Got a couple of uh, feet. I'm uh, moving on, as they say. Uh, Sunny m 0 syw says, on behalf of the training team, teaching done on through foundation, intermediate and full, it was an interesting experience, a point for the debate of straight to full license he's talking about there as well. I remember I was teaching you on the intermediate bit, and it was one yeah. of those moments which you, um, you've probably had in your life as well, where, where I thought, this man knows much more than mine. Why am I sitting here teaching him and, and lots of others, of course, in the, in the room at the same time? But I, as I said to you the other day, I, I still treasure very much that silicon slice that you gave me. And I used it at every intermediate practical that we did since then. And I've used it to show friends and things because it's a wonderful thing to have to show how a silicon chip is, is made now with that, with that silicon die. So thank you for that from me, because that will certainly carry on being used. Uh, Stuart M0JKB says, Zena and I first met Anne and Donald at a pizza restaurant in Norwich many years ago, well before I was a licensed amateur. And never in my wildest dreams did I think that I would be telling this man not to forget to write down Ohm's Law on the back of his foundation exam paper, as he may need it in the exam. <laughs> Does that mean to make sense to you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But with yeah. a memory like yours and all these different languages and the things you've just recalled your life without a, a pause or a hesitation, I'm amazed that you'd need to write down uh, sim something simple like that on the back of the exam, Ohm's Law. Well, the thing is, 
Stuart was uh, reason quite reasonably worried, but sometimes these are in their way very important because I remember as an undergraduate going into an examination and the first thing I did was write that down. Now, you might not know what that means. I don't know. But so far as I was concerned, uh, I will write down C-O-H, O-H, uh, C-O-H. I keep going. It was a structure. I, keep, I haven't finished it. It's a structure of glucose. Wow. Uh, so yeah, you do have to remember. You have to remember things. But my feeling is, if you can get somebody to understand Ohm's law, then I, 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 this has always gone from my teaching. If I can get you to understand things, then the amount of things you actually have to remember is very small. And does it help? I mean, I'm just speaking for myself, I guess, but, but maybe you, you, with all the students that you've taught over the years, you may have found others the same. I've always learned things better if I can see the point of learning them. I'm not very good at remembering things. If someone says, you've got to remember that, and I'll say, why? And they say, well, because I say so. But if, if there's a real reason, if, it's, if, it's a, if I can see the application of it and the relevance of it, I'd always remember things more. Is that something that you found generally in life with all the people that you've taught? Um, I think... It's a very good point, David, because um, in terms of languages these days, um, it's not important because I, like learning Morse code, learning Swede, learning Finnish, the language is so completely different. I'm just accepting the different words simply as a code. Now, it comes, I suppose, eventually by a form of training, a training yourself, but we can't expect students to accept this. And this is why I think understanding, understand as much as you can, because the more you understand, the less you have to remember. Yes, and that, that is a really good lesson. And may I say on behalf of many of the students, I'm sure, who are going to be taking, continuing to take exams in RSGB, uh, for sure uh, that it'll help if they can make sure and it help them and give them confidence that you're there on the very committee that's deciding on whether you know the questions are making sure they're valid and understandable um, because uh, certainly in my time as uh, with the exams and courses there have been people who've challenged questions sometimes we understand it sometimes maybe not so much but it's nice to know that you do take all those seriously and that helps to build new questions just to finish by the way Stuart's point he does say thanks for a great night Kindest regards to you and Anne from both Cena and Stuart. And P.S. Tom and Rita are both well. So I guess. Oh, I'm delighted to hear that. Absolutely delighted. And uh, thank both Stuart and Zena for the good wishes and good wishes to them too. Thank you. Yes. And I'm going to finish now with your good self on this because this is, I know for some people tuning in, especially halfway through maybe, seeing some of that fairly heavy stuff. They may not have understood, but this is a lovely compliment for the way you've talked to us tonight. Uh, Nev M Zero NFY says, "Thank you, Donard. Very nice to have a talk that I actually understand." Oh, well, that's nice. So that is really nice. Thank you, Neville. Thank you ever so much for tonight and for taking us on that journey. Um, you know, it's, it's it has been quite a journey, and uh, it was nice in, as well in the pieces that you gave me to write into the newsletter that you feel very fortunate and luck to be in the right Absolutely. place at the right time and many times. I felt that about my life as well many times and, and you, you were kind enough to say the same thing for yourself. The right place, right yeah. time and a lot of luck goes with you as well. But um, A but lot of luck, yeah, and you know, <clears throat> as I say, even with the case with prostate cancer, you've got to take it as it comes and you've got to make the best of it, whatever that is. Yes, yeah, well... Thank you ever so much for, for joining us tonight, Donard, and sharing Thank you. part of your life. And, um, and may I suggest that we finish on the piece that you told me that you, you it might be a good place to feed, where a teacher used to say to you, apparently, I'll say it in my English accent, have you, got, have you not got any homes to go to? And well, how would you say that? In Dublin, you say, oh, Jesus, has just no homes to go to. <laughs> uh, only you could have done that. 
If I'd have done it, it would have caused offence. But thank you ever so much to, tonight, Donard. Take care. My pleasure. And thanks to everybody. And I hope they've enjoyed it as much as I have enjoyed talking as well. Thank you. Take bye care. Bye-bye. There we are. Wow. What a story and what a life. Thank you very much uh, to Donard, of course, for that tonight. And, um, and also just to remind you then what's happening uh, next week at the club. We've got uh, GBTRS News on Sunday at 7 o'clock. On Monday, 3rd of May, Monday Night Net, talking about what would be your ideal shack if money was no object. At half past eight, the 80 metre CW Net. And on Wednesday, next Wednesday, the 5th of May, NARC Live, the Orsted Wind Farm Project. We've got someone live from Orsted to come and talk to us. We would love your questions. Um, so if you want to send us them in advance, as I said, we can send them, submit them in advance or not, if you prefer not, but it gives them a chance to respond to them because it's certainly going to affect Norfolk in quite a large way with the project that's been approved. So let us know, drop us a line to this address, radio at dcpmicro.com. But I think that's about it now. If you want to know what's happening on the, uh, ra the radio club and indeed in Norfolk, have a look at our Norfolk on the air slide. It's on our website, has lots of other information about our club as well. And this is the address, www.norfolkamateurradio.org. Once again, thank you very much to Donard for, for tonight. And thank you and goodbye from Tammy M0TC. Goodbye. And from me, David G7URP. Don't forget to keep getting on the air to care. Good night.